Now, I don't think it's a bad thing if during the hunting season you're creating a buck vacuum, meaning that you're attracting a high percentage of the mature bucks onto your land during the hunting season, and then you're, because of that, shooting an unfair number of mature bucks over a period of time. Let's say 10 years, you shoot 80% of the target bucks in the area. You can do that. That's what I talk to clients about all the time. That's what I do myself. I take it personally if I don't shoot the target box I'm after every single year, at least two. And that being said, your property has to be set up properly in order to do that. Now the first step in creating a buck vacuum, in creating a property that sucks in the majority of the daylight mature buck movement in the area, is you cannot be overrun by does on your property during the summertime. And there's a few reasons for that. Mature bucks look for a reclusive area to call their own. They look for an area that is unpressured by female social pressure, and they like to find that depth of cover that they can move back into and say, this is my spot, there's no hunting pressure, I don't have female social pressure. And let's face it, when you have yearling buck dispersal that happens at a year and a half, sometimes fawns in big ag areas where there's a lot of deer, but young bucks will be kicked out of the herd by their mothers and they travel, science study shows, and I've seen that around in ag land up in the UP of Michigan. I think if you're in northern areas, if you're in big woods areas, whether it's Kentucky, Pennsylvania, northern Minnesota, um, then what I find is yearling bucks might disperse a little bit more because it takes them longer to find a spot that they want to settle into. And when they're in ag land, they might not disperse as far. Maybe they disperse three quarters of a mile a mile instead of that mile and a half average because they find conditions that they want to hold in, conditions that are away from female social pressure, pressure which is the entire reason why they were kicked out of the herd in the first place, female social pressure. The last place they want to find is an area dominated by female social pressure. I hate to keep saying that word, but it's so critical as it relates to mature bucks, dispersing yearling bucks, and creating a property that you can suck mature bucks into and bucks in general during the hunting season. And the first step is you have to have a property during the summertime that is not loaded up with does. If you have great summer food plots and you have high numbers of does and fawns and you have a high number of does and fawns that then extend into the hunting season, they can destroy your fall plot, your fall food sources before it's time, before it's that magical October, November, December time where you want to really hold those bucks, attract them, hold them, protect them, grow them to the next age class and actually shoot them too at times. You can't have a quality herd without a quality hunt. You can't have a quality hunt without a quality herd. They both go together and that happens during the fall. If your property is overrun in that doe factory, just released a video on doe factory, you can look it up, just type in doe factory solutions, doe factory risks on whitetail parcels, you'll find that, that video. And when you have those does that are on that land during the summertime, does that are here today are here to stay, they transfer into the fall, they eat your fall forages before they get to maturity, before you get good volume on them. You know, if, if you're bra planting brassicas, for example, you want brassicas in that 30 inch range, if you have a high number of does and fawns, I've seen properties where they don't make it over four or five inches. They just beat it down to the ground. There's no appreciable food. If you're planting August peas, late planted beans, oats, if you have corn, beans, whatever it is, they can decimate your food sources before it even gets to the hunting season. A great property census doesn't take place in August and September. Throw that advice out the window. That's a pivot point your property is either gonna do worse at that time or better. If you have a great fall property, your property will shoot through the roof to where your October, November numbers are the numbers you need to take a look at, either if it's a bad property or a good property. That's reflective of your level of influence during that time. What I like to see is if you have a property where you're not overrun with does, whether you need to eliminate summer food, whether you're, it could be that you're using summer food to attract a new population of deer, you're trying to raise the population, that's okay. Or you're trying to establish a new food plot program. But bottom line is if you have a lot of does going into the hunting season, that's a bad thing. They take up space, they take up that depth, they take they infringe on that depth for mature bucks to actually be on your property. Sure, you might have a lot of bucks deer in the heart of the rut, but if you are banking on the heart of the rut for your hunting and you're working on your land all year, you're spending 
tens of thousands of dollars on the land, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're putting tens of thousands of dollars into resource tractors, trees, whatever it is, and you're only hunting during the rut, that's a very poor parcel plan. Just here to tell you. A great plan you can hunt all year long, and that's because you're sucking in those bucks. Now, if you more evenly distribute those does during the summertime, meaning you cut down on those summer food sources if they're not needed. If your population isn't at max, have those summer food plots. But if you're working on a high population of does, get rid of the summer food sources, let those does and fawns trickle out to your neighbors in those fringe areas of your land, maybe a quarter, half mile away. Don't worry, they'll come back, especially if you have the best habitat in the area. But you want those does and fawns to reside during the summer, largely in someone else's land, if possible. You expose those does to more even hunting pressure around the entire neighborhood. If the populations are high, not all areas are high, but if they are high, then you expose those does and fawns to a high number of hunting pressure. That helps keep the does and fawns to a minimum on your land when they shift, when those other properties are being hunted, when they're pressured, when you have alfalfa that's turning stemmy and dormant, where it's getting its last cutting, when you have beans that are turning brown. Then at that time, in mid-September to mid-October, you're starting to get the, those does and fawns filtering back on your land to a smaller number because a lot of those does and fawns will stay on your neighbor's lands too. So you don't want to have the best, most attractive land in the summertime. And that's the first step in creating a buck vacuum because when you have open ground, when you have food sources that have been allowed to reach their volume, and you have a high quality property that you're working on high stem count cover that bucks can't reside on during the summertime, but they prefer in the fall. Hardwood regeneration, woody shrub tips, briars. You have that type of habitat that's attractive in the fall and you add that fall food. Then you have openings on that land. It's like a motel with a vacancy sign. A lot of properties are no vacancy before the season even starts. So once you get into that hunting season, now you have open ground, you have depth of cover, you have great fall cover, you have great fall food. Now you set up a land where mature bucks will, can focus on during the daylight. And let's face it, less than 10% that I've experienced, less than 10% of all whitetail lands, attract the attention of daylight mature buck focus for the majority of the season. I want your property to be one of those. This property is one of those. We don't see a lot of bucks here in September. They start to filter on in October. The does start to filter on this property in October. Sometimes during October and November, we have a lot of does and fawns in this property. Creating a doe factory during the hunting season. A doe factory is created during the summer. So if you don't have those does spilling over, spoiling your food plot and the amount of forage, the amount of volume, expending your resources of space, bedding areas, then you have that more even trickle of bucks and does that come on your property during the heart of the season. I'm standing in a spot where I shot a buck we were after a few years ago, a 2016 called Diego. He's a five-year-old buck we'd followed for three years. He was in this wheelhouse of movement. We have a buck this year, the split brow buck that we're looking forward to finding. I actually shot Diego as he stood right here out of the stand behind me. So we call that the Diego stand. I know, real original. So that's the Diego stand. Shot Diego here. Diego didn't come on this property typically until late September and especially more mid-October. We passed him right over here on October 12th. And he was low light, grainy footage. Kind of passed him again down here. I think that was uh, October 30th in the evening. It was a big cold front. And finally on October 1st, hour into daylight, he's traveling right through here, plain as day. Um, it was a difficult recovery. Uh, with Diego at that point but he sucked onto this property he was this property we create a vacuum on all these bedding areas are typically not full when you're getting into September October there's a good vacancy for bucks and does to come onto this property during the fall once they get here we have the line of movements that I'm a, that I talked about in another video meaning that we have a huge line of movement all the way around this property it connects big food with multiple water holes, mock scrapes, big bench system, cut travel corridors, cut bedding, natural bedding areas. It's not the deer run around the loop, but they'll use this quarter or this third religiously. In fact, the year before we shot Diego, he was using the lower portion of that loop. He wasn't up here. I shot a six-year-old buck in 2015, took him out of the herd, then Diego all of a sudden moved up here. So he took over this territory, especially in this area right here, low and high. 
but we have the conditions set up. We don't have too many does. We allow for that soft trickle to come in during late September to late October. We have the hardwood regeneration, the bedding areas, the fall food. We allow our fall food to get to an appreciable amount because the does and fawns aren't waiting there hammering it in, October, or in August when it first comes up. So by the time we get into October, we have a lot of food compared to everyone in the area. We have on this 30 acre parcel, we capture a large percentage of the daylight mature buck movement for October, November, and December. We even see that carrying to January. The split brow buck was just over here, 150 yards, um, February 15th. So we had them regularly throughout the season and past the season. Try to create that buck vacuum on your property. Try to set up those conditions so that you are one of the few properties in the area where you're attracting that daylight movement of bucks. Most of the time people are over pressure in their land, they're over pressure in their food plots. By the time you add summer food in and a lot of does carrying over to fall season, there's just not a lot of space where there's mature bucks can get away. Again, going back to that female social pressure where they can find that remote area that they can call their own that relates to does and relates to movement. Of course, you want does on your property. You just don't want to be overrun with does. We could fill this property and I hear it all the time. My property has so many does and fawns that the mature bucks I see are either at in the middle of the night, they're in the middle of the rut, or they're just non-existent. And that's a bad thing, any one of those scenarios. You can create that property, create that buck vacuum this year. I hope the tips on this channel help you do that. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please check out my books. I talk about all these strategies. I have four books. I have a children's book out there, a teenage book. So a lot of these strategies are reinforced over and over again. They do work. I've seen them work hundreds of times across client parcels, let alone on my own properties, leased properties, properties I own in Wisconsin, Michigan. And believe it or not, on public land, you're looking for these same condition. You're looking for lines of movement, areas that aren't taken over by does. You're looking for cruising areas during November. And it all goes back to female social pressure, making sure you don't have too many does in your land, and making your property inviting for a mature buck vacuum during the heart of the hunting season and not just during the middle of the rut.